Hello everyone, today we talk about the Duchy of Spoleto existing from the late 6th uh, until essentially the beginning of the 13th century. The Duke known as a broader office in the, the Papal States that fundamentally absorbed this territory would remain in some way also local as a lay power, interestingly enough, because of course the Papal territories were ruled also in a, uh, in a lay uh, a true layman and not just legates and so on. It's something we will see hopefully better in some video, f further video about the Papal States. The duchy was established uh, by the Longbirds. The fact that there is a uh, history of Spoleto itself that we can make for the uh, medieval cities series today. We do not talk about the city as such, right? But it was, of course, a, a Roman one in hand to hand, even some interesting military uh, stories like Munatius Plancus had taken refuge there uh, uh, after the, the Bellum Perusinum, it was um, a garrison in the time of Narses. So, as we'll learn now, uh, the, the position of the city in, in the Apennine, in central Italy, in constituting, in fact, also in, during the, from the Longobard times throughout, eventually, the, the, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, history. Uh, this the essentially the the southernmost uh, chunk, or at least of the lay government of, of the Holy Roman Empire, because this land was severed practically from the rest of the Italic Kingdom, of which it was technically part of. That's the, the interesting thing. By of course the the Papal States as they consolidated. Uh, arguably, at this point, as you know, through the investiture struggle and the, the general, in fact, debate on, say, the the, the extent, at least, of the um, uh, papal control on, on the secular government, right, as opposed to the, the imperial prerogative that should have been there for basically anyone who was not part of the church, so as technically not even a earthly domain, remains, right? These are lands that, as we will see, were negotiated throughout all the history of the empire for this or that emperor to, to be recognized as such, to cross certain paths and so on, but being the southernmost lands uh, of the empire, maybe not uh, the um, literally so, because at least at some point the emperors thought that the you know their rule would extend far south, and as we will see, in fact, the relations between the Duchy of Spoleto and the one of Benevent are quite meaningful here. In fact, we are talking about the so-called Langobardia Minor, right? Spoleto was actually the exception that confirms the rule of what is otherwise, in fact, not still not believed in pop culture like the consistent political unity of the Longobard kingdom that basically was uh, recognized as such by everyone, even by the Benementans, without any trouble, right, from essentially the end of the 6th century onwards. Well, the Spolitans were the only Longobards who truly were instead uh, treacherous by a degree, right, siding either with, with the papacy, was just next door, uh, as much as the Exarch uh, or Ravenna, but playing their cards very shrewdly and, of course, also uh, harassing uh, the latter, as we will see now. This role is, is fascinating also in Frankish times and in, in later feudal ones, so we will essentially look um, at this, right? Definitely the, the heyday of, of uh, the, the, the duchy uh, of Spoleto was under the, the Longbirds, right? This was the moment in which, exactly because of its autonomous um, role, location, uh, behavior. Uh, uh, the uh, the duchy also had a properly a ruler on its own. Later on, in spite this autonomy would continue. Of course, think about the fragmentation in post carlingian times, where even emperors technically that simply exploited the fact that Rome was next door to be crowned by the popes, and that that counts, right? In the, in fact, um, uh, as uh, in the list of Holy Roman emperors, as a matter of fact. But that wouldn't have so much power on the longer run. The same duchy would gradually uh, lose as most feudal powers in Italy uh, its control over uh, the, the main cities, the main centers. Spoleto was, was also a communa on, on its own at some point. Uh, but the Ghibelline profile, this, this is interesting, and it's feudal 
a meaning, right, would be used in a quite consistently political and strategical way by, by the emperors, uh, by the Italic kings, uh, whether they were to try to achieve something, especially as far as the papacy was concerned. Um, so, again, the, the church will de definitely uh, incorporate the territory uh, into its states, right, and there it would basically uh, last. Again, we will talk about the city of Spoleto on another occasion, if you're interested. It's not one of the top um, medieval cities uh, in Italy, but it, it's still interesting, right? We talked about Perugia recently, so but this Umbrian um, environment, we, we began to, to appreciate a little bit. In fact, we talked about Spoleto and the clashes with, with Perugia at that point. In any case, when in 571, the Longobard invasion pushed uh, its conspicuous way towards um, central and southern uh, Italy. And the Duchy of Benevent had been likely already established. The Duchy of Spoleto was uh, established at some point, because we don't know, right? This is a relatively, um, say, peripheral area, right, compared to the more advanced uh, once also within the same Longobard kingdom, about the uh, the Duchy of Benevent, we think technically that it had been founded, if not as such, but at least as a county uh, in Byzantine times, when some Longobards that had remained together with Narses at the end of the war were settled uh, in the that other strategic uh, settlement of the Apennines, rising to a you know, more powerful center now with this Longobard, further Longobard replenishment and autonomization from Constantinople uh, than Spoleto, right? Because the, the Longobardia Minor is all this, essentially what, what is, we will see now south of the axis between Rome and Ravenna. And Spoleto being quite a pain in the behind because it controlled the Via Flaminia, and that's uh, so what connected Rome and, and Ravenna to, to a certain path, there were different strongholds and mostly there, the clashes between the Byzantines and, and the Longobards happened there but again, it's it's a mountainous area, it's not overwhelmingly populated or developed or whatever, so we also know less, documentarily speaking um, and Spoleto would not be much of, of the might of, of the Duchy of Benevent for example, but it, it's important as, in as much as it basically managed to, to maintain its own autonomy until fairly late uh, in, in Longobard history, and after that acquiring uh, an important relevance uh, as the frontier, properly of the Carolingian Empire, in uh, in, in the south, in, in Italy. Uh, I talked about this in the video about the Carolingian domination of Italy that uh, addressed in part Friuli, um, Spoleto, as well as these frontier areas. Um, uh, and um, in appreciating fundamentally also what the Carolingian policy with the, the local dukes really, really were. As we all see, as tiny as the, this, this power was, however, it was taken particular care of by the, the, all the emperor, like by the Carolingians, by later the, the Ottonians, the, the Salians, the, the Swabians, etc., because it really had that, like it, it, it helped uh, crossing the Apennine, right, to, to in part to Rome, in part to southern Italy, and this was needed as hell, right, in the time, especially of Henry VI, Frederick II, when, when the Germans had inherited um, the Sicilian kingdom, and so they needed to make their troops cross uh, the, the central um, Italian Apennine exactly in these places. Um, so, but looking back again in, to, to longer times, um, say both the Duchy of Benevent and the one of Spoleto were destined to survive the fortunes of the Longobard people, right? Exactly because of their strategic location. Uh, thanks to also the, the actual, uh, the actual places, the, the nature and the environment, right? The excellent geographical position that is not decisive per se, but the fact that now, having witnessed the installation of consistent Longobard 
community that was you know severed basically from from the Langobardia Maior and actually being okay with that because as we all see the the the, the Pavese kings carry out uh, campaigns of, of subjugation against Spoleto, as, as Benevent, by the way, I, I made a video about Langobardia Minor, right, not specifically about Benevent, mostly about Benevent, so if you're interested, you can look at that, we'll do something more precise to the point, it was not um, actually from this uh, newer reg historical regional series. Um, the Apennine Mountains, right, massive natural bulwark, uh, quite uh, kind of rude, kind of harsh uh, grounds, um, you know, communities, forested areas, uh, narrow passes, um, uh, strongholds everywhere. Um, however, the fact that these territories were surrounded by uh, lightly garrisoned uh, Byzantine uh, centers um, would make the Longobards experience Band without encountering excessive resistance either. Again, they didn't have much of a power themselves, but overall, right, considering what happened, and again, I made videos about Byzantine Italy, you can look at, especially this, this the corridor between, uh, the Apenninic corridor between Ravenna and Rome, um, was uh, at some point eroded. Uh, admittedly, these politans would never manage to, to break it, to, to, to seize control of it, um, but they had, generally speaking, the upper hand, right? It just, uh, it was the broader Longobard kingdom and eventually was sweeping this, this area of, of the further Byzantine presence, not the Spolitans per se, even when it started happening locally. Um, however, as we also said, um, the uh, Longobard kings of Pavia didn't have much of a, you know, even of, a, of an interest or particular concern, let's be honest, of taming just Polito per se. They would simply at some point walk in there, as we will see, appoint their own uh, their own duke, uh, or Gastald, and leave, and then when he died, as it was normal in, in, in Longobard, Italy, because there was no dynastic succession, the locals would elect like a more faithful one, and then attrition could happen, but Spoleto was not definitely threatening the political territorial integrity of the Longobard kingdom that was actually... That, eventually took it over, in fact, in the end. Um, uh, there is a difference also between the fate of Spoleto and Benevent, because the the first one um, lasted less than the latter, uh, to be quite uh, to the point. Uh, it, it ceased to exist as an autonomous territory, um, de facto, after the Frankish conquest, and even in the late Longobard period, as we've seen, um, as a de facto independent one, let's, let's be honest, because again, the autonomy there would always be maintained by some degree, but not much of as a, you know, policy of power. Also, because there were, even in post carolingian times, more, more powerful players uh, in in Italy. I talked about this in the video about Hugh of Provence and the Italian uh, opposition to him. He played a lot with Mary into this uh, this this uh, nobility uh, that the, the Dukes of Spoleto did embody. Um, so much so that the Church uh, managed to annex the the Duchy only in the 13th century. Because of this, the relations with Spoleto were always of particular importance. Uh, with all uh, for all the neighbors, right? Spoleto dominated the Via Flaminia, and therefore the communications between Rome and the, the Adriatic, that is between the Roman Duchy, right, the Byzantine one, uh, and the Exarchate of Ravenna, uh, that controlled the Pentapolis. That, as we will see, was the target of the Spolitans, more often than not the Exarchate, as you know, being the the, the center of. Um, of, of mainland Byzantine Italy, uh, eventually taken over by the Longbirds. Uh, and we note that a chain of fortified cities loyal to Constantinople or to the Exarch, because telling the truth here, you know, trying to distinguish, like, from especially the the mid sixth century, uh, seventh century at the latest onwards between, say, Byzantines and Longbirds, as if they were not 
the fact to Italians locally it doesn't make much sense, especially in these areas that had nothing to do with the Greek-speaking kind of coastal urban dimension of the south. These were all unequivocally uh, Italic areas now with this Germanic presence. Um, but we're talking still about uh, important centers like Bomarzo, Orte, Ameria, Narni, Terni, Perugia, that we observe. Uh, in fact, during, throughout this early medieval time in the aforementioned video as well, stretched along the Flaminia Road or next to it. And even if the Longbergs of Spoleto never managed to conquer them except for Narni, nevertheless they indirectly obtained an advantage from their presence, right? Because, as we said, they separated them from the Longbird, the other long, Longbird powers, and, and favored their autonomy, right? Uh, the Beneventans were not much of a problem uh, in the south, by the way, because they bored the, the two duchies bored. We were talking about mainly the Longobard, the Amaya, and so anyone who, essentially the Lom Lombardy and Tuscany, right, Emilia, the, those areas, um, the north, the, the, the Friulans were too far to never venture there. At least they would send military contingents, things like that, but in the in the main royal army. And the Beneventans were fundamentally okay with the Spolitans, again, that he wouldn't... At some point, they, they bonded with one another. They tried to actually cumulate dynastically, on, let's say, the two duchies uh, together. Uh, the series of the Longobard Dukes of Spoleto begins with Faroald, that rules... Uh, it's the first generation, right, of Longobards uh, in Italy, from say 571, 591, right? We know very few about these guys because again, they're not like they're just names in some account that you know that uh, allows us to, to actually see what they were doing, but we don't know so, so many d details locally. Also, because Paul the Deacon, we, we know mostly just about Friuli because Paul the Deacon was from there, we don't even know too much about Lombardy itself, right? Um, well, this guy seems to have conquered. Uh, nonetheless, then Classe, the, that used to say the port of Ravenna. So, um, a big deal, because that was literally, uh, and even he managed to hold that, it seemingly he conquered it around 584. So in a time in which the Byzantines, first of all, were still substantially strong, even just as, a, you know, in terms of sending uh, field armies to Italy, connecting with the Franks. Um, so it was a bold... Um, uh, enterprise definitely mirroring it, that the, the kind of long original Longobard Central European, um, you know, um, bravado that was connected with war warlike culture. And it was a sound move, by the way, because it complicated uh, the Byzantine maneuvers in, in in the region in the first place. Um, however, the Longobards were unable to make use of this possession uh, for themselves because they uh, they were not a seaborne people, right? So Classe was a very important maritime base. Um, the the Longbirds didn't practically have a fleet, or at least uh, at some point they seized it when they seized, for example, Pisa or other coastal centers in a more decentralized areas from Byzantine authority. They, they seized, we know, they seized the Dramas, and they even started uh, raiding Sardinia, uh, and, you know, on the other side of the sea. Um, in the case of the Adriatic, it was much more complicated because uh, the Byzantines still were strong at sea, and so uh, there was not much of a way to, to even defend uh, from, from the sea itself. But it was just a way like saying, look at it, we are vicious, we can infest you, and we're here to stay, also because we're entrenched in these fortified positions in the Apennines, which are you know, a logistical and strategic nightmare um, in the first place, and we're good at at holding that, uh, at least. Um, which means, however, they succeeded for some time in cutting off the exarch of Ravenna from Constantinople. Right. It seems that Faroald also conquered uh, the towns of Fermo and of Amiterno, uh, the latter near to the later, um, you know, settlement of Aquila the Eagle, fa founded by Frederick II. Um, Farald was succeeded by Arulf, so you understand here very very Germanic names. He ruled between 591 and 601, and under him, 
the Duchy of Spoleto reached its maximum extension. In fact, the Duke went as far as Fano, uh, and therefore to the borders of the Pentapolis, and also conquered Osimo. It was one of these coastal centers. The Pentapolis, again, it's five towns that were quite, uh, you know, uh, Roman, or at least, you know, were, were controlled by the Byzantines, and, and that were... Uh, important to secure the the the, the coastal navigation there, uh, and that thing, in fact, wouldn't last long. Uh, Osimo um, reverted to the Byzantines in 598. Thus, the Duchy of Spoleto came to include almost uh, all of the mountainous part of central Italy. This is a, a huge deal. Mostly they controlled the uh, Adriatic side of, of the watershed, as you understand. But again, the uh, road towards Rome was also constantly threatened. Um, the boundaries between the Spoleto Duchy, the Roman uh, one, and the Byzantine lands of the Adriatic coasts are, um, say, also floating a little bit. Because they are, uh, in part, only partially documented. But we know there was guerrilla, uh, hit-and-run strategy and tactics, scorched earth, uh, raids, things like that. As a consequence, these borders must have actually been subject to modifications depending on the fortunes of the armies. Um, while towards the, the, the Longbird uh, ones, the, the, the Longbird duchies, they remain almost uh, unchanged. Right, um, The kings of Pavia didn't have much to do with these local clashes, especially as long as they damaged uh, the Exarch of Ravenna, that was more or less their arch enemy, albeit from the beginning of the of the 7th century, always on the defensive, and so not much of a threat. Actually, they, they recognized, at least the Byzantines recognized the the fair complete of, of the of the Longobard uh, territorial possessions in, in the peninsula at that point. Um, now, given Ariulf's expansionist tendencies, it is understandable that he also attempted the biggest coup, that is, the conquest of Rome. Um, at this time, say, Agile uh, besieged Rome, later Lutfrand, would, so again, the, the Longobards were not um, they were not able, actually, to seize the herbs, but they uh, thought about it, um, be, especially before the, the situation with the uh, papacy was normalized in the, in the very, say, in the, at the beginning of the of the seventh century. The same, the same agile, frankly, would, as you know, change quite his his attitude through his wife Theodolinda, her epistolary with, with Rome, with the fact that. Objectively, that that was the uh, too much of a powerful ally, especially to rule in Italy. From there are very interesting letters also of of Gregory to the same to the same Byzantines, telling them that look, if if I want, he was literally saying, you know, you, you know, you can the Byzantines would would be expelled from the peninsula, and he was right about that. I mean, if he had s simply sided openly with the Longbirds, that would have been the case, and Longbirds, especially from the the seventh century, um, they converted to Catholicism without any news of persecutions of disorders. It was all very smooth, um, and situations in improved dramatically. Uh, this is in part true even for um, the Spolitans. Um However, uh, at this point, it there was surely an opportunity to try to breach uh, into Rome, right? Uh, that truly had some faction was more prone to, you know, to help the Longbirds one would stick more with the Byzantines. This is a pretty foggy time, in part, because at least initially in the Duchy of Rome, there would be a sort of Byzantine garrison, but along the longer run, there was the so-called Militia Romanorum, and it was just a local Roman uh, force. Um, the Popes were beginning at this point only to, to consolidate something that was properly territorial, even beyond Rome, and in power, and in a time in which the Arabs were literally halfening the the power of the Byzantines. So, in, in a change, was in a time it was definitely decentralizing much, right, Italy from from the empire. Um, uh, in any case, we know from 
uh, Gregory the Great that uh, he was uh, very lively concerned of the uh, of the Longbird threat that the Exarch was not helping him sufficiently, right? Uh, and uh, uh, in, in this sense, the the, the papacy owed much to the, the great authority and the uh, diplomatic ability of Gregory, right? That uh, really made the Roman papacy stepping yet up to a higher level of international recognition and spiritual uh, supremacy. We've made lots of videos about this, but it, it's never too like we should make several tens of videos to explain actually what Gregory the Great did, because again, it's not just ah the Anglo Saxons or you know. Um, we made something about Saint Aquitius and other. It, it, it's a much deeper um, deal for Latin Germanic civilization that uh, the Longbirds, in this sense, were also, you know, quite uh, responsive towards in, in positive terms. In any case, as far as Polito is concerned, with the death of Ariulf, uh, the two sons of uh, Farald, of what the death of their father had not been able to succeed him due to their minority, aspire to the succession and oppose each other. And uh, Theodelab uh, wins, right? He would rule actually an awfully long time for, for, for the era, right up to the uh, mid-7th uh, century, from 601-653. Um, interestingly enough, his uh, long dominion uh, largely coincides with that of uh, of the Benevent and Arikus chronologically since um, just then the Longbird reign largely is parallel with that of uh, Arikus of Benevent, right, that a great uh, ruler um, and at this point um, the Longbird kingdom as a as wall, well, the Longbird domination is, is consolidating to an unprecedented um, level of political and, and territorial achievement. Like most also of the struggle with the Byzantine is over because the the um uh, the longer birds as we've seen are now se secure enough, right? Nobody is able to, to dislodge them uh, anymore. The the Frankish um Byzantine attempt to also seize the, the Paul Valley back again has failed. So Spolizo leaves a bit of like on, on the wake of this of this prosperity. Um, there is uh, surely a, a contact between Langobardia Minor uh, and uh, the, the Meyer enough to to appreciate the, the general relations that Spoleto would, would have, right? Despite being the the most rebellious of of the Dutchies, right? The the Duke of Benevent Grimald, that was actually Friuland by birth, would become. Um, king of the Longbirds uh, in the Po Valley himself. Like, they were, as the the kings were normally elected, right? There is this is actually a moment of great unity. And again, uh, I made lots of videos about the Longbirds. If if you literally still think that the Longbirds were that story you've been told, they were all divided, uh, inefficient. Um, you know, just know that it's not just a matter of, of opinion. That it's not true. Like it's the diametrically opposite of that we can historiographically assess today. Don't leave um, 70 years uh, later, uh, say earlier in time, uh, still historiography has gone really uh, a lot forward and we know really a lot to the point that we we are perfectly aware actually of the fact that by the, the late 7th century, the fragmentation of the Merovingian kingdoms at that point, four in one, this was the, the most solid and politically unitary power in the entire Latin Germanic Europe and uh, the myth of the fragmentation uh, is literally a myth right by written by German and Italian nationalists in, in even in good faith actually mis misunderstanding the sources in the 19th century uh, and that has been completely debunked entirely to to an incredible level of embarrassment especially for the dramatic level of public uh, and administrative uh, and institutional advancement of of the Longobard kingdom um, so uh, 
Upon the death of the Duke of Spoleto Atto, who succeeded the aforementioned Teodolab, uh, the King of the Longbirds, Grimwald, uh, reaffirming the ancient right of kings uh, of his people, appointed himself the new Duke of Spoleto as well, right, uh, in the person uh, of a very loyal one of his, Transamund, that was um, actually a, a southern longer, but not from Spoleto, but uh, he had been Count of Capua, as well as his son-in-law. So you understand that at this point, the monarchic power already is uh, capable of simply changing the guy at the time, actually just waiting for the, the previous one to to um, to die, right, and simply putting their own guy. This tells you how smooth, peaceful the whole thing practically was, and how inconsistent the idea that, that even Spoleto was basically outside of the kingdom in this sense really is. Um, in this way, Grimoald managed to attract both the most powerful Longbird uh, principality further into the royal orbit uh, since the time of Outer where the, the crown had not been properly uh, uh, rejected by anyone. Everybody recognized that formally they were all part of the kingdom of the, of the Longbirds. They were under that rule, under the, uh, the monarchy, that's it. right? What, what they did politically could be more or less in line, but there is no threat posed, nor to the institution, not to its territorial integrity. Um, and by the way, um, this um, while Grimald was in the north, his son Romuald resided in Benevent. Um, this state of affairs admittedly lasted a short time, f uh, at least for this broader, say, affirmation on the on on the Spolitan duchy. Um, Grimald died, and the nobilities of the two duchies resumed part of their autonomy as they were not kings of of the Longbirds anymore. Some other uh, northerners uh, reacquired the... Uh, were elected by the, the nobility as such. Um, Transamund ruled Spoleto from 663 to 703. It seems that for a time he associated um, also his brother Vakilab in his domain. Uh, his son Farald II, ruling between 703 and 720, succeeded him, um, who, like his namesake, seems to have conquered Classe again from the Byzantines, again for, for a short time, by the way. In 712, um, Farald II also bought the Comitatus of Sabina, uh, in the south of Riete, in which, by the way, uh, a gasalt from, from Spoleto had always been present, say at least a steward, some kind of, um, uh, of, uh, say, vassal is a big word, but, you know, still somewhat dependent on, on, on the dukes of, of Spoleto. Th this is particularly important because it, it's a very um, close area uh, to Rome. Um, the um, Comitatus, the, the county of Sabina, would be uh, returned to the papacy 30 years later. But for the time being, you know, it, it was concerning, right? Um, uh, the uh, Farald starts behaving like, like a lord in the area, uh, so much so that he uh, essentially takes on the task of protecting the Abbey of Farfa. At this point, everybody here is Catholic, by the way, there, is no, there are no Aryans anymore. Um, and f and this very rich, powerful, famous um, uh, abbey is restored and enriched with donations, right? Consider that uh, the, the Longbirds in the, the very first days had raided, had first destroyed Monte Cassino, all these things, but now they, they acted, now as I understand, as just the local uh, uh, landlords perfectly integrated in the, the Catholic um uh, church and hierarchy administration. On an uncertain date uh, between 718 and 720, Farald is deposed um, and perhaps killed by his son Transamund II, which is you know, nice familiar relations. But again, there are factions 
uh, different clans right in in the city, uh, in the various um, settlements, um, and this this transmund is definitely, however, reflecting a, 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 an adventurous and turbulent character in the highest degree, right? Uh, so much so that he's uh, always uh, struggling with the energic um, Longobard king Lutbrand, who wants to assert the authority. Uh, uh, directly on the two southern duchies and even succeeding in that right this is particularly important Lutbrand is by far the most powerful uh, king in Longobard history he ruled uh, on the on the realm at, at, at the peak uh, of its power its extension uh, fully deeply Catholic ruler uh, there hadn't been Aryans again already from from quite a while he expanded did um, on the on Rothery's uh, edict, uh, he uh, has definitely a, a unitary intent, right? Already uh, from the time of Agil, that the Longbert kings style uh, styled themselves uh, "Grazia Dei Rex Totius Italia," Regis Totius Italia. This is a by the grace of God, kings of all of Italy. That naturally, considering the fact that um, aside from the obvious geographical fact you know it's 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 a, it's a peninsula bottle in you know by, by the alps um the byzantines were still there so stressing the unitarity of, of the land was was a way also to claim what what was say left there in pure church and, and he was succeeding right it's at this point that most of the uh byzantine lands have have been eroded and the entire system is wavering right the longer birds are uh, Ravenna will be captured. Rome is, say, that the Longobards at this point are actually uh, Lutbrand was allied with uh, Charles Martel. They were also in very good relation with the Franks uh, at this point. Uh, the former um, Carolingian asked Lutbrand to send troops in Provence against the Saracens that were swarming in, into Gaul. Um, Lutbrand also recovers some important relics. Um, in Sardinia, that the, the Saracens had raided. I mean, he is one of you know one of the most um, famous kings um, of the time, and he naturally wants to affirm a more unitary rule also within the the kingdom. This was achieved by normally appointing not dukes uh, anymore when these died, but electing locally a direct representative of the king, known as as a gastal. So this politics as we were saying before, were the most riotous of, of all the Longbirds, or basically the only ones, um, uh, and that entrenched in, in their own Apennine uh, strongholds, didn't want to give up. Again, not a threat to anyone, really, but a bit like somebody you have to go there to convince properly. Uh, in 726, uh, Transamund intervenes, by the way, in the iconoclastic struggle, um, that was, uh, as you know, m messing up consistently the Byzantine Empire in favor of the Pope. This is interesting. Um, naturally, this was done at his own advantage, right, uh, by increasing his power in the area against, um, you know, the, the last Byzantine avant posts. And that's when he appropriated himself of Narni, which will also hold until 742. We will we'll see what, what happens. Um, in 729, there are two expeditions, in fact, of Lutbrand. At 729, 742 against the Spolitans, the king manages to assert his own authority. In the first case, he won Spoleto without a fight. Because, say, literally, the Longobard royal army marched into Spoleto. That's it. You know, uh, he made um, Transamon swearing full allegiance to, to himself to the king, um, and the interesting thing is that Lutbrand doesn't even, you know, doesn't behave harshly. He leaves Transima, uh there as Duke of Spoleto with his own dignity and an essential autonomy, because again, there was no, no sp aside from this kind of initial, like, I want to re reaffirm my power with a major expedition in the south, like, there's no reason for which these peoples are uh, except you know disobeying namely right uh, causing any any drama or threat or you know 
having a, a, put, a, a dangerous military potential that was a road. No, right? It was sufficient simply to walk into the place and having themselves recognized as a king. Ten years later, uh, however, there is a bigger campaign in which Transamund decides to ally himself with the Byzantines. Um, and uh, this time, given that the Longobards cared very much about the given ward and the fact Transamund had eventually broken his uh, former oath, Lutbrand was strongly determined to reduce the duke uh, to duty in a definitive way. Right, so he reappeared in force in the Spalton duchy, and um, the Spalatans tried, given that the royal army is too strong for being met in, in, in open field, um, to, in fact, set, an, set up an ambush together with the Byzantines. And um, interestingly enough, the, 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 ambush, the ambush succeeded in the sense that, you know, the, the royal army walks into it, but um, the rear guard of the Frio lands, right, led by uh, Rathkes and Heistulf, as we will see now future uh, Longobard kings, uh, crushes, right, the Spolitan Byzantine attempt to take out the uh, the royal army, right, Lutbrand really owes to these guys a lot, he had actually followed, say, uh, initially quarreled with them, but for similar reasons, mostly connected with problems with the the appointment of ecclesiastical rule, etc. But these freelance were really uh, valorous, and they managed, even though falling in the ambush of pushing the enemy forces back in the forest between Fano and Fossumbrone, are very, say, tough terrain, uh, forested, um, you know, on, on the river at that point, um, uh, you know, in the mountains. So it's an interesting setting also for this uh, 8th century, you know, Longbert showdown. Um, as a consequence, uh, the Spolitans are crushed. Transamund flees to Rome, by the way. Uh, and so showing, in a sense, that also the papal apprehension towards this, you know, strong Longobard consolidation in Italy at that point, that would have triggered also the, the, the Frankish, the, the call to the Franks, that frankly were also quite embarrassed by the thing, because they were allied with the Longobards at that point. Um, and that will take, in fact, some time also, as they were a bit coping with their own problems in turn to intervene on a longer run uh, a decade later mostly uh, the the, the Pippin and uh, Arnulfingian recognition will be accomplished with substitution with the uh, with the Merovingians um, the Duchy of Spoleto is ruled at this point by uh, a guy placed by Lutbrand that is Ilderic Lutbrand asks the Pope to hand over the rebel duke, but in vain, since the Pope had, as we just said, every interest in playing uh, these guys against each other, and if anything, in remaining in good agreement with his um, powerful neighbor, as he was uh, with the Duke uh, of, of Benjamin, uh, as well. We know that Lutbrand did not dare go all the way uh, with the Pope, right? There was no, you know, broader reason just to, say, attack Rome for this point, for what, like, you know, the, the Catholic power would have been a bit too compromising. But he limited himself to taking from him, the f uh, from, from, from the rebel Duke of Spoleto, um, the four cities of Polymarcia, Bleda, Amere, and Orte, then he left for uh, the Po Valley uh, back uh, again, while Transamund managed to retake Spoleto uh, and holding it until 742. Here I said the expedition was in 440, um, 39 these, these years. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? There was no greater problem all in all. It was just, again, showing that, let's say, weakening dramatically, as we understand also with this proof of force, like the the general uh, resistance of Spoleto such, right? Uh, there hadn't been much of a of a match. Arguably, yes, that, that ambush had been quite uh, warring, but it wasn't the first time that the Longbirds were walking into the Dutch, uh, say, that the king, Longbird kings were walking into the Dutch, a bit like 
the Franks with, with longbirds, right? They, before annexating them, they invaded them a couple of times, and so everything was showing who was the strongest, and, and until the, the conquest was the, mature for, for good. The reason why 742 is so momentous is the fact that before dying, Transamund had to cede the ducal dignity to a nephew of the King Lutbrand, Agibrand. The Duke of Cusi. There is another Umbrian Dutch, interestingly enough. Um, so, in the process, um, Spoleto loses all the lands taken from the Roman Duchy, by the way. Um, and um, what, what you understand what, what happens here, you know, that there is still the recognition that the land, say, seized from, from the from the Pope in practice, or at least in, this is a still a kind of a frontier. You don't have to imagine like the, the Pope having like all the the soldiers on the frontier holding all the the. They wouldn't be able to do it even for a consist for many other centuries, in in Lazio itself. Um, however, there was somebody still essentially connected uh, to, you know, the, the broader papal authority um, and kind of authoritativeness uh, as such that held that Dutch at least as a lay power, right, as the, this, this former kind of Byzantine uh, uh, in fact administrative province that however was not Byzantine anymore and so that the Longobard king says, okay, well let's treat it like, you know, it's the papacy, this is important in the um, in the process, everybody was thinking like that, telling the truth, in the process of formation of the papal states. Now, Lutzbrand dies um, in the early 40s, um, so that uh, the, um, the the Duchy of Spoleto um, tries um, his luck, taking back at least um, part of the lost lands, also in within, within the same Spoleton one, right, that had been modified f further. Um, from 745-6 to 551, Lupo appears as a as a duke, right? This guy enjoys uh, almost uh, independence from the new uh, the new Longbird king, that is Ratkes, right? The, the the Duke of Friuli that had been also with his brother Isulf, the future king, his brother. Um, in uh, in the in the battle between Fano in the ambush we, we, we said before, um, it's a moment. It's a delicate moment because at this point the papacy is actually concluding the alliance with the Franks. Um, the Longbirds are leaving a moment of um, say say not really destabilization, but let's say the economy was. Uh, pumping back to the point that there were richer people around were starting to agitate a bit synetically, right, the political social space, nothing to be particularly uh, concerned of, but with the Frankish pressure mounting north of the Alps in this sense that the Longbirds were not as capable as those, there is a bit of a you know, a moral uh, turbulence, right, Rathkes is also a bit this guy. He he he's deposed by his own brother, but mostly because there, there is the as always the Longobard nobility that decides that because it's an ele the only functional elective monarchy that I'm aware of in the Middle Ages um, that puts him in a monastery. The two actually remain in very good terms, but Ratkus has a sort of mystical um, crisis. Let's say he will come back to the throne actually after his. Um, brother's death, that as you know was defeated multiple times by the Franks. He died uh, by, in a in a in a hunting accident. Fell from horseback, um, and um, in, in this process, Spoleto manages to gain a little bit more of you know autonomy. Uh, th this Lupo uh, himself holds the Dutch until his death, seven hundred. Um, 50, uh, 56. Between 757 and 58, uh, the Duke of Spoleto was uh, a guy called Alboin, like the first Longbird King. It has nothing to do with him, naturally. Um, Vus wore allegiance to the Pope. 
and the king of the Franks. Right uh, at this point, the Longobards had already been invaded. Right, uh, the their army crushed by uh, the Franks, um, and uh, it's evident that uh, you know the, the Carolingians are about to take over at some point. So. Uh, the the Spolitans think that there's not much, of course, that they can do individually about that because the main kingdom is is falling apart. So they, in a sense, devote themselves uh, to, especially to the papacy, which is so close, and they know he, that it's going to rise in power in the process. So they think it's it's the way to go. Um, as a consequence, Polito feels. Um, increasingly detached from the kingdom of Pavia and instead attracts attra is attracted by the, the, the natural center of Rome. However, exactly because um, the uh, Longbird crown now was depending on the Franks um, that had uh, essentially uh, granted in exchange naturally for for a bribery the same to the, uh, the Lombard uh, Desiderius, right, the last king of the Longbirds, and the Saint Carolingians actually had a lot of problems to cope with, including Pepin's uh, the short death and the fact that Charlemagne, as you know, had to contend his reign from his brother Carloman till the death of the latter before he could even intervene into Italy. And that that still, you know, was in technically more relaxed terms once again with, with the Franks because of this mostly like the, 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 the Carolingians may have not actually reunited dynastically the whole empire and uh, at least we would have not had the, the, the this uh, after all accidental dynastic unitary moments like the one of Charlemagne after Carloman the same Louis the Pius right so history may have gone differently um, however this temporary say uh, uh, let's say rule of the Zedarius that was surely isolated internationally, but was recognized as king of the Longbirds at least by uh, the the Neustria, right, the, the the western part of the Po Valley, that was the most um, powerful part of Tuscany, depending on them. Not much by the, the by the Austrians, the Friulans, right, the northeasterns, one from the Venetian area. Because those thought that he had simply, in fact, bought his crown from from the Franks, that they wouldn't recognize them as such. In any case, the Desiderius was powerful enough to reassert its his power on Spoleto and Benevent, showing how again uh, it was feasible, even for a depleted and um, not much internationally autonomous, uh, say, independent power anymore. Um, like the kingdom was at the time, to reassert this internal unity. Right. As a consequence, in Spoleto, the Zidarius installed Gisulf, one of his creations, in April 759. So for the entire following 20 years, the Duchy of Spoleto is still, again, pretty close to Pavia, right, on documents, as it had not been the case um, uh, for his predecessors. Gisulf appears until uh, July 761 as Duke, right? Uh, and it seems that after that, um, for two years at least, uh, Spoleto was without one, right? Um, from 763 to October 773, Theodosius was Duke, right? Uh, this was also completely devoted to the king that, as we've seen, wanted to be properly stressing that all these guys were acting on his behalf personally, which again the Longbirds didn't do because they or they traditionally believed that uh, if somebody ruled somewhere, especially as a duke, was you know, his own, was God's will, basically, and um, they didn't want to humiliate and uh, on the contrary, great part of the as you've seen on the, of the Longbird cohesion was based on this the, the recognition of this ethnic um, rule uh, traditionally shared, like with elected kings and all, and, and dukes, by the way. Um, and um, the interesting thing about this Theodosius uh, is that he he's believed to have fallen at the Alpine locks against the Franks. Right, this was the final like uh, attempt to to defend the kingdom in at least this kind of subalpine 
fortificatory uh, uh, systems that couldn't, however, match the, say, Frankish power. Admittedly, Charlemagne would take nine months, the longest siege in the entire Carolingian military history, to seize Pavia, so that was already a thing, again, in a much more urbanized um, region than than Central Europe, like, you know, the, the longer kingdom, generally speaking, was. Um, and uh, in the process, however, you know, being dissolved, right? So, uh, these fateful duke was just, you know, confirming at least the, the long bird readiness to die for, for the Roman king uh, in battle. When the news of Desiderius' defeat, well, they, were, they were considered in part, as we've seen from, from the Austrian perspective, a matter of personal, right, uh, achievement. Um, so the, this news reached uh, Spoleto, the fate of the duchy uh, was decided. Um, and there is a very meaningful action that the uh, inhabitants do, that is, they make a formal act of submission to the Pope. And they let their heads being shaved in the Roman fashion, not in the Longobard traditional ethnic one, right? So they basically turned Roman, in a sense. Um, as much as they accept the new Duke, Ildebrand, from the Pope. So here the, the, the papal hegemony, also, say, spiritually at least, on, on Spoleto as a again, more like the central Italian uh, polity and uh, and not, say, part of the, of the broader kingdom was disgregated uh, is, is fascinating, because, by the way, as we were saying before, uh, Spoleto doesn't go on as a Longobard power. I mean, of course, the people were the same, but they become part of the, the Italic... Uh, the, the kingdom of Italy was changed the name, as you know, by Charlemagne, that becomes the king of Right, so admittedly, Charlemagne was also properly king of the Longobards while ruling in Italy, something that, again, the Longobards were very privileged by because it wasn't done with any other people the Franks conquered, for obvious reasons. But the Spalatans didn't consider themselves, let's say, a surviving Longobard polity, right? Nor, even though in, in the kingdom there was you could choose whether to be legally and so ethnically a long bird or a Frank or a Roman, whatever, the most powerful Spolitans decide to side with the papacy, like saying, okay, let's invest there, because at least the, the, the kingdom is done for, at least against the Franks, and uh, the papacy has a acquired an enormous prestige. Let's be together with these guys, given that we're just also next door. The Beneventans instead go on as long birds ethnically till, till the end, right? And uh, th this is very important to stress. Um, till the end, meaning until the Longobard con uh, the, the Norman conquest, and admittedly there were some uh, still Longobard blows until I think the, the 19th century, like in the ancient, uh, say, in the ancient regime, kind of um, legal collection of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which is fascinating. Uh, but this was the case also in the north, at least up to throughout most of the Middle Ages. Um, the um now the the, the this Ildebrand, uh this Duke Ildebrand remained uh, only a short time subjected to Rome though, because from seven hundred seventy six, so just a couple of years after the Frankish conquest, this Politan documents are dated to the to the years of uh of Charles. And subsequent subsequently the new Duke Ildebrand's Dependence on the Frankish king was accentuated ever more. Um, again, the, the Franks were not really forcing hand like they in Italy. They were quite cautious because they feared revolts, uh, etc. So they just mostly led the longer bird uh, dukes dying out. But as we've seen, it was just quite conveniently the local tradition, right? Without any dynastic connection, and eventually pointing their own, and instead start going towards a more dynastic uh, profile. In any case, um, this is a defeated country, right? Uh, Spoleto is, um, doesn't have an autonomy anymore. It had enjoyed uh, under the Longobard kings. The Carolingian Empire is something much bigger, much more 
um, you know, assert of uh, its military system, to which all uh, the subjects participate is, as you know, much larger, has much greater roots, it has a much greater deterrent power capacity, like, um, the core of the Longwear Kingdom was just, like, uh, one of one of the chunks that, that had made the entire Carolingian domination even before the conquest, right? So it's really another another thing. And it's a revived universal empire, which the papacy, as we've seen, is, is being crucial. Um, the dukes become now simple officials and representatives of the uh, of cent- say, central power. Bear in mind that the Italic kingdom will be the one with, under Louis II, etc., that will be the the one the emperor rules from. Um, the Duke Hildebrand died around 789. Um, he was succeeded by this time, like he, the guy was Longbird. This uh, th- this time by a, a Frankish nobleman, Guinegis. Right, these guys are important uh, in the Carolingian milieu because again, the mostly the best. Uh, of the Frankish nobility sent to Italy because they want the Charlemagne wants just the, the, the most trusted, uh, most powerful houses to install there, uh, and uh, because it's again it's the most prestigious kingdom uh, of the empire, and they especially here there is a there is a frontier right there is a uh, technically a different people already as, as we've seen lands that they could conquer but that they needed to maintain uh, that's why I mentioned before that bit about the Carolingian um, domination of Italy and there are some in- interesting uh, actions from this uh, Guinegis because um, for example he saved Pope Leo III from um, a Roman conspiracy uh, by some you know opponents that were still connected with perhaps a bit of Longobard Byzantine revanchism because many Longobards had fled yeah not maybe so many but consistent part of them to, to the Byzantines as well that were reactivating their power once the Longobards had been crushed and the Carolingians had consolidated there and they were quite um, quite freaking out because of that <laughs> to, to put it bluntly um, so the, there was this um, Pascal and Campolus in Rome that were plotting against the Pope and the the, the Frankish Duke of Spoleto intervenes. Uh, Leo the Third is in fact notoriously expelled from Rome. Uh, he 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 say he escapes um, barely with his life, and it's Guinegis that accompanies him to Paderborn, right to Charlemagne in seven hundred ninety nine, and that's. The year after what what you know on, on Christmas Eve the you know the the the, the Roman imperial crowning of Charlemagne elected by the Roman people in the Basilica of Saint Peter occurs right so these are the men that are so close to to the to the Pope to the Emperor right. Shortly after the coronation of Charles, it seems that the Duchy of Spoleto was increased uh, with the, by the essentially the annexation of the um, Teatensis Gasol date um, centered in Chieti, that's uh, in the south of Spoleto, right in, in the Abruzzi, uh, reaching as far as Ortona, the one famous battle in 944. Uh, that is taken by the Spolitans in 802. These are coastal centers. They are relevant because the, the Longbirds had... Um, uh, I made a video, I don't remember how it's called, it's, but I think the, the Longbird settlement in Italy that tells you more or less in detail this this entire picture. Like, because some of these areas had been going back and forth between the Longbirds and the Byzantines. At this point, this, the Dutch of Spolita is augmented with the southern territories as multiple layers, right? These are all uh, valleys that run from the Apennines to, to the Adriatic Sea. It's literally a valley after another, so they're very convenient, strategically speaking. Um, and subsequently, it seems that the territory of Camerino um, and Fermo would achieve um, a certain autonomy. 
in the process were sub entanglements right within the same Dutch of Spolid. Uh the 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 county or 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 mark of Camerino will be uh, yet another important fief in the area historically we will maybe talk about that sometimes. Uh Guinegis being moved to war um with um with Pepin of Italy the son of Charlemagne against the Duke of of Benevent right it was an expedition we were leading from from the Poval against uh, against this southern Longbirds right and the, the Spolitans at this point were in fact fighting against the latter um Guinegis is taken prisoner by the Longbirds however he's also he's released and um could continue to hold the Duchy of Spoleto right it seems at this point together with a son of his has been associated to the throne until 822 when he uh, retired to a convent interestingly enough again this was uh, a bit of a normal practice uh, at the time either mostly if you were taken out in some way also in the, Byz- in the Byzantine case well okay in both cases Frankish Byzantines you know your your eyes carved out and you know closed in a monastery and then suspiciously dying faster than than, than time very often after the you know the same effect of this torture now this was a voluntary thing um and it makes you reflect right this frankish guy come uh born and bred in kind of northern central europe wherever uh, having been installed as duke of spoleto having saved the past having waged war having seen the world right and then deciding to retreat from it to withdraw from it that's interesting um there follows a, a period about which we're a little informed about Spoleto until um, in 842, a new duke, Guy, uh, it seems of Frankish origins, um, uh, appears, right? Uh, four years later, he seems to have helped save Rome from a Saracen attack. So we see the Spolitans uh, involved in consistently in the defense um, of, of Rome, just given the, the close proximity. Right, their their dukes, right, maintained us that even in the Frankish world, where most powers were counties, right, these are something bigger, right. They're a frontier area. They they have a ducal power. They have also this Longobard sense of this. We know that there were some picked bodies of Longobard warriors who were sent to fighting in Saxony, in 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 uh, Avaria, uh, etc. In the Carolingian armies, right, and they weren't kidding. Um, this guy we find intervening again in the Beneventan area, um, uh, fighting again. He he helps Adenulf of Salerno to repress uh, a revolt of Landulf or Landenulf or Capua, right? Because the the Duchy of Benevent is also now a bit less unitary than before. At least there, there are these other centers, Salerno, Capua. We, we've talked them the, the other day in the video about Amalfi that was. It's that the Byzantine coast there, but still with a lot of connection, especially with Salerno. But in, in the process, uh, Guy um, acquires uh, the localities of Sora, Arpino, Bicalvi, Athena, for his own Spolitan dominion. So it was still, yeah, intervening, but even in there showing, but this Frankish power essentially saying, okay, yeah, I protect you, but I want something in exchange. It's always the same business, let's say. Um, so it seems that um, he has associated his sons Guy and Lambert to his own dominion, assigning um, um, uh, to Guy uh, the uh, the Count of Camerin, or Mark of Camerin, we, we don't know actually, what the, because sometimes they changed, in, in especially in this uh, late Carolingian time. Um, and um, the other son, uh, the, the Dachi, right? Uh, they, they were somehow, like, uh, hierarchically, his political was more important, but Camerino is, is a bit in, more in the south, and it's a bit of a, like a, a fief on its own, right, of consistent power in his own regard. And this was naturally because, differently from the long birds, that at least in terms of these... Um, these uh, the, the polities, right, that this public um, districts, they wouldn't inherit, right, that they would pass, but they would be elected as rulers, right. In, here the Franks instead uh, inherit, uh, like they split, they, they think it's their own personal possession, right, and they 
they have um and so they split it equally among the the male um and the sons this is um uh, again going in parallel with also a frankish transformation a bit of longbert italy as far as feudalism is concerned it would never be so strong there like it were again in italy it was a very strong public culture right because of roman and of longbert legacy as well the the dukes ruled from the the cities that were literate in the north they just made war right not of the alps um but um let's say that um the franks managed to somehow an injure a bit of that public culture to to privatize a, a bit to personalize a bit so the dutch of spolito starts falling into that broader frankish world that we intend as western europe aside from the non-ethnic frankish areas uh, like this ones um we are also not really sure about how all this uh inheritance was split uh whatever because there are no documents uh, telling us exactly how it happened um as a consequence we also don't know in which year we think between 859 and 866 Guise's son Lambert succeeded him in the ducal dignity and interestingly enough uh sacking Rome in 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 867 right uh this happening again in uh still in, in for for sort of private personal interest at this point louis the second of italy reigns and is an effective ruler he had managed to launch successful operations and he will keep doing that in the south so much so that um uh, lambert was deposed for the obvious uh, affront having entered the holiest um uh city and um uh, having of course interfere with papal policy again today there is no time to digress but the concept is that there were always two factions and especially at this point towards the late carolingian phase a lot of agitations uh you know even within uh, italy for either western francia or eastern francia the thing would evolve i made a video about the rome of charles uh the fat charles the third um and we will talk about that uh, again. Lambert um, was, however, reinstated as Duke of Spoleto by Charles the Bald, who, as you know, uh, was uh, Charles um, Charles the Second, right? Um, Emperor. Uh, he came to Rome. He he came to yes, but he he first came to Italy. He negotiated with his army, and he the the eastern franks arrived as well and they were about to, to kill them, themselves in probably the largest bloodbath even larger than the one of fontenoy but they agreed that the guy would come back to france just with his imperial crown and not set foot in italy and so the germans wouldn't um and so these areas were remaining evidently ever more um decentralized ever more autonomous in that process of the fact of disgregation uh, of the empire now what what happened is uh that uh, this Lambert was a bit like the a-hole of the situation as basically uh, Charles the Bald just didn't know what to use he entrusted him with the defense of Rome which after what had happened was not perhaps that the best choice uh, as you understand and the task was against defending against the Saracens but this um this guy, without any qualification, actually allied himself with the Saracens, besieged the Pope in St. Peter, and forced him to flee from Rome. Uh, so you understand the prestige of controlling Rome, especially after now the the practice from Louis de Pius of crowning the emperors locally uh, is uh, by the hands of the St. Pope, the, the, with the acclamation of the Roman people is that the actual deal right so it's an enormous power and and um you know that there's not much that a duke of spoleto can do at that point taking over the, the carolingian empire no but it, in terms of his personal prestige and consolidation in central italy it's it's really important uh, apparently his son guy and then his brother guy they were called a bit the same way guy guido uh, etc succeeded him 
right? This um, this hono, ho, homonymy is actually quite uh, annoying because we don't understand who's who at this point. In any case, we understand that the latter rebels against uh, the weak Charles the Fat and places himself at the head of the rapacious Saracen gangs himself. Right? There are similar things. There are some Frankish leaders that, uh, I don't know, in Aquitaine, we've seen in the video about medieval Gascony, ally themselves with the Vikings and make raids. Um, and the, the, the purpose in this case is, is um, readily evident when the adventurer will succeed in conquering the crown of Italy for himself. Consider that the Carolingian Emperor is, is over at this point. So again, there are Spolitan emperors, yes. Um, and there are, uh, as kings of Italy, because the, you, you technically had to be a king of Italy in the first place to be crowned emperor. So uh, the Spolitans are among the, the groups, again, of the Marquis of Tuscany, the, the, the Dukes, uh, uh, say there is uh, Ivra, there is Friuli, um, there are other entities that play basically this game, but none of them can control even the entire Italic kingdom in the following generations. Um, uh, it, it is to be believed that Guy um, left eventually the effective gov uh, government of the duchy of Spoleto in, in other hands, uh, even because he was even at least quite of a uh, controversial figure, and precisely to the Marquis Guy, who was perhaps from another branch of the same family, because these were like clans, right? Uh, we talk about, we're talking long about Frankish times, at this point they, they, there's still not much that kind of sense of lineage that will appear mostly from the following centuries. So there were big groups, right, that descended from the same guy, and mostly, as we've seen, shared things in a bit of an equal way, uh, they were not so vertically divided. Um, or they were, but not as much as they were stratified or horizontally divided, let's say. Um, and we find, in fact, this Guy uh, as Duke of Spoleto after um, the death of uh, the Saint Charles the Fat. In 895, Guy is invited by his son in law, Guaymar of Salerno. As you understand, the Spolitans and the, the the southern Longbirds were married into each other still because everything was starting to, to become dynastic, as we've seen. Um, so that he takes Benevent from the Byzantines, interestingly enough, uh, that are reactivating and living a moment of fair, uh, you know, reconsolidation in southern Italy, and keeps... Um, the same Benevent for about two years, right? Benevent will never actually fall to to the Byzantines or to any other power permanently, right? But again, it was about trying to, to re simply take control and not allowing a broader uh, consolidation at the outskirts of this territory. And so there were other centers, as you understand, that were... Um, <clears throat> They were rising like Salerno, Capo, and so on. Guy perished in 897, however, at the hands of Alberic, who was Marquis of Camerino. So you understand there is an infighting between these, uh, main, say, main centers within the Dutch. Alberic is a fascinating figure because it seems that uh, from the uh, killing of Guy, he actually managed to dominate Spoleto until his own death in 924, which is a big deal. Um, we're not completely sure, but surely he exercised a lot of power in, in the Dutch at that point. Uh, he uh, also led the Spoleton troops in the Christian coalition at the Battle of the Garigliano River in 915, that was basically the um, the greatest victory uh, uh, scored over the uh, the Saracens uh, in 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 Italy uh, through uh, with an enormous effort, like forces from the entire kingdom, also from the Byzantines, from some maritime republics. It's a very interesting operation, and the Spolitans had their own um, their own uh, merit in, in the process. The uh, Saracen 
Allen Post, uh, the mouth of, of the Garigliano was uh, taken out. Uh, the, the Saracens left uh, for good central Italy. They had been raiding to, uh, up to Sabina, far from. So the younger centrals of what his politics were, were uh, cooperating as, as far as now expelling the Saracens were, were concerned, in spite of their old bad reputation, at least from the previous branch of the family. Um, now, in the 10th century, the history of the Dukes of Spoleto becomes really confused, right? There are a few sources, it's the Iron Century. Um, naturally, there are interesting figures, um, but they're not so powerful as they had been before, at least that they were important to a degree, like the, the Duke manages to hold on for a sufficiently long time and to form even a dynasty. Right, but uh, it's mostly the other Italian affairs that uh, repercuss, especially from the kingdom uh, of Italy uh, in, in Spoleto, right, that remains a sort of provincial power. Um, the dukes succeed one another at short intervals, there's not that, you know, sound capacity. Again, it's, it's a critical time in many ways, uh, much depends on the fortune of, of the Spolitan protectors, right, contending for the Italian crown rather than else. Um, the Magyars enter the, this territory, at some point they're crushed, and, and I don't think it was in Spolitan, it was rather in, in Benevent among the, the Longobards. So interesting episodes occur here and there, but it's not mm, particularly... Um, big deal. We hardly know the names of the dukes, for example, not even all of them, right? Some isolated names of their dominion are unknown, but uh, everything is also more, again, feudalizing. There are local, smaller lords, um, uh, knights emerging, you know, everything becomes less compact than in Carolingian times. This is exactly the moment of the greatest fragmentation. Um, we can mention, however, Pandulf Ironhead, um, that actually was, was a Longobard and uh, was uh, elected Duke of Spoleto by Otto I. He ruled uh, between 967 and uh, 981. Um, the Ottonians have stepped into Italy and so they have uh, affirmed like a single, uh, a single monarchy. Um, so the the Spolitans just follow. Um, Pandolf is succeeded as Duke of Spoleto by his son Landolf. Then we have uh, Hugh, Marquis of Tuscany. It is at least mentioned as Duke between 989 and 995. So we just have, like, we don't even know when he and how he rose to power fell, like, so um, this kind of uncertainties. Now, during the 11th century, the duchy is conferred several times by the emperors to the, their great German vassals, right? Even though, as you know, the Germans weren't, uh, say, successful in maintaining a, a permanent control uh, uh, in, in Italy, especially in this century, uh, that also sees the, the investiture controversy, basically that there is also the precocious rise of of the communes uh, at the end of it, so it's really going towards another, everything is going towards another direction. The feudal uh, system is in crisis, or at least is, is coming undone, right? But in this more, if you want, even in primitive areas of, of the Apennines, um, the, the idea that the Duke of Spoleto is part of this holy Roman imperial feudal hierarchy, Right, and that they represent at least imperial rule to, to a degree. They act on behalf of the emperors. Um, and they do have connection uh, with the other side of, of the Alps, also because they also come literally from there. Right, as, um, as that is, um, is quite deeply felt. And so Spoleto will have this important function, as we will see now, especially in the struggle between the Germanic um, emperors and, and the Roman papacy. Um, for example, the German Victor II is Duke of Spoleto in 1056 um, until uh, uh, until 1070. He seems to have succeeded Godfrey the Bird, the Duke of Lorraine. There are many again uh, people coming from France, from from 
from Germany. Uh, the 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 Italian nobility is quite like this, like this essentially longer bird Frankish. Uh, at this point, say, Ottonian um, elements that uh, the married to each other it's from, from since the beginning, from the end of the Longobard Kingdom. Uh, Burgundians too, uh, there are, we've seen them often in the videos about all these various regions. They're very, uh, and they are especially ever more, considering the cons the consolidation of properly the, the nobility, of the military aristocracy in particular, from the 10th century, 11th century, they're ever more kind of projected towards that international kind of connection. This is typical, right? The communes are very powerful, but reason much more locally because they are they're not feudal powers uh, these um uh, these noblemen uh, in spite of the fact that they will participate right to the you know the, the the system they will know how to change skin let's say but they um they are more obviously projected towards the international side of the story also because as ghibellines they hope that uh, the for at least the imperial authority to revive to the point of co-opting them, and at least keeping to rule in a from a decentralized position, especially in these areas. Um, uh, we are also at this time less certain about the dominion over Spoleto and Camerino of Godfrey the the Anchback and his wife, the great Countess Matilda of Canossa who also owned lands in the Spoleto area, in spite of her, and in the Camerino mark, right, in spite of her, as you know, massive dominion across Tuscany up to, you know, across the, uh, the, the Pau Valley until, until the Alps, uh, one of the, strangely enough, we never talked about the Canossas just as such, that's an idea for a new video, but was one of the most powerful noblemen. Um, uh, in noble houses in Europe at the time, and the the inheritance of Matilda, as you know, will remain uh, a great object of content between the emperor and, and the papacy. Uh, well, she had possessions in Spoleto as well, together with her husband and uh, like various those who claimed the inheritance at least. Um, the Emperor Henry IV, the Salian, granted Spoleto in 1094 to Werner, the son of the homonymous lord of the Anconitan Mark. Um, so Anconitan is, is just there, it's been carved out as a mark uh, later on, but it's still part of the, in the marches, it's close to, to Spoleto, in, at least as the bird fly. Um, uh, Werner's son, that is also called Werner, succeeded his father in 1130 and, and fell uh, in uh, uh, in the in Barbarossa's army in 1158 during the siege of Crema in Lombardy. Right, and that tells you again who these men were and what they did for a living. I mean, these were. Again, German appointees in, in Italy that were meant to mobilize the, the, the local clientels supporting the emperors. By the way, in times that which, as we've seen, the, the imperial authority had eclipsed itself, right, between these two baroners from the time, respectively, Henry IV and uh, Frederick Barbarossa, uh, there is actually a pretty long time span and in, in which the, the emperors had not, uh, say if they had, had not exercised any effective power in Italy, um, so they all had their own roots uh, in in the land uh, themselves. Now they um, they are connected, in fact, with with Germany to the point that the uh, the do uh, the the Duchy of Spoleto is uh, conferred in 1136 to Henry X of Bavaria, that as we've seen the other day uh, in the video about the Duchy of Saxony, is nonetheless the father then the, of Henry the Lion. So the Welfen, famously enough, were the Este dynasty. They had been settled in, in Carolingian times. They were coming from Italy. They came back to Germany after centuries just to rise, basically, as the second largest German power um, to contend even the Barbarossa one, uh, the one of the Swabians. Um, so owning Saxony, Bavaria. So we're talking about like um, 
a remarkable centrality of Spoleto as far as you know the, this international nobility of the empire is is, is concerned. In 1155, uh, and just to tell you how also independent they technically were, um, Spoleto was rebellious uh, to the same Frederick Barbarossa. Uh, because we know that, because the emperor set it on fire, you know, during the, the, the his expedition, he, did, he would just raise to the ground all the hostiles that uh, would resist his own power. Uh, naturally, in making everything very simple, because as you understand, the history is complicated. Uh, so Spoleto had, uh, by this point, starting to manifest like other Italian communes as sort of power on its own. So the, there was a parallel power to one of the duke, to one of the the commune, uh, things like these. Uh, they're complicated to just um, tell. In any case, you have to consider that the Dutch, as such, doesn't quite exist as a single power, right? In early medieval times, even though they were weaker times, still you had a greater compactness, right? At least nominally. At this point you have, again, Camerino, you have other marches. So Spoleto is the official seat of a feudal ruler that has some rights that are uh, of different nature. They're, they're both public. Again, this duchy was created by the Longbirds, was just uh, an ancient... Uh, administrative repartition of the uh, of the kingdom of Italy, the duke had a specific function, right, to exercise justice, to again carry out police operation, and things that are kind of also higher in in nature, as we've seen with the caliber of the guys that came, that were unfailed, right, um, and um, the, including the wealth. And, but there are lots of other lords, uh, minor ones, admittedly, but still, you know, complicating the picture. Communes now that are, you know, expanding, that they're just there, and you can't quite um, simply take them out, right? Even Spolis Pol- is raised to the ground by Frederick Barbarossa is um, eventually entering the game again, because... In 1158, the same Frederick grants the same city to his uncle Guelph VI of Bavaria. So again, the Welfen branch, because Frederick also descended famously enough from from the Welfen, on his mother's side. Um, and this Guelph VI apparently returns the duchy to the same emperor in 1168 or around that time. right? So the Barbarossa gives Spoleto again to other uh, of his loyals. Bidelulf, uh, then Conrad of Urslingen, who is mentioned in 1185, and um, must have not survived uh, to see the times of um, at least Frederick II, where he, he died before Henry VI at that point. But you understand how important Spoleto had become now because uh, the Hohenstaufen had essentially inherited dynastically the Kingdom of Sicily and Spoleto again represented uh, a very important uh, point of passage for the south from the north that again was very complicated already in so because because of the Lombard League but at least the war with those uh, was over now and at least the Emperor could cross uh, leaving the Lombards alone, but uh, the uh, again, the, the reign of Frederick II uh, the various expeditions, as we'll see now of Otto the Ford, Conrad the Ford, etc. were always counting on the Duke of Spoleto, right? Especially because during the fierce struggle that is unleashed against the Oenstaufen by the Roman Church, the latter actually claims uh, the, the duchy as part of the papal states. Mm-hmm. So this um, this goes back to an old issue that we discussed elsewhere, that is to say when um, the Pope had called the Franks for the first time, uh, 
in in the eighth century to right to to crush the Longbirds, uh, he had asked literally to Pippin the Short the actual control of everything in Italy until um, the uh, the Adige River in the north. So basically, the entire almost um, half of the Po Valley and, and basically all of central and southern Italy in papal hands. Right, I will not digress today on explaining, I mean, the reason it's obvious, but there were also broader papal connections there with the southern lands. In any case, um, the, uh, the, the, the popes, while struggling against the emperors that, as you understand, were also struggling to control these territories in the far south of their domain, um, didn't, um, I mean, had to at least receive by the same emperors the formal recognition, at least that part of all these lands south of, um, say, at least some of, some of these central and part even in, in northern Italy would belong to them, right? They went by tracks, right? For example, the, the, the papacy claimed uh, southern Tuscany to be part of, of, of the papal states. That never was right, in terms of, uh, because it was claimed on the base of old um, uh, archip metropolitan jurisdiction, thing like that, matter of ecclesiastical hierarchy. The problem is that the emperors were instead about secular governments. It was a different thing. Southern Tuscany would never be part of the papal states simply because there were powerful communes that the papacy didn't even have at some point, even the interest, because they were wealth to attack. Um, the era of Spoleto instead will be basically taken over by the papacy entirely, as it was the one of Ravenna, Bologna, um, uh, that were recognized by this or that emperor as the popes, because of, I don't know, finally, uh, the Romagnol heiress by um, Rudolf of Habsburg at the end of the 13th century to be elected king of Germany. Right? He would simply say, okay, that's yours. As emperor, I will not ask you uh, that land anymore, it's yours, I said, I'm the emperor, so that's it, all right. At this point, instead, things were, uh, by the beginning of the 13th century, things were much um, shadier, right, Consider that, as we were saying before, the, the papacy didn't quite have, and it wouldn't have for a long time yet, the actual control on, say, direct occupation of the, the papal state. Right, that would happen just in the modern age, just to make you understand that. But surely, during the 12th century especially, they had made a lot of progress, especially since they had won uh, the investiture struggles with the conquered date of arms. Um, and I, had, I made a video about that, the one of, I don't remember, the, the Sutri Agreement? Not the Sutri Donation, which is also one of the least momentful things that in history that you may remember for other as the foundation of the papal state, it's not quite the thing. But at this start, uh, this starting around those places, uh, at in, as far as the Spolitan in, uh, sphere of influence was concerned. Um, in any case, um, the, um, the 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 sense of the the duchy being recognized by uh, the emperors as quite powerful in the surrounding lands. It's something that dates back uh, to Carolingian times, right, at the time of Hildebrand, that uh, was given by Charlemagne, quote, cunctum ducatum spoletanum seu beneventanum. So that in theory, at least in Charlemagne's mind, uh, that was also seeking to essentially make of Benevent still essentially completing the conquest of the Longobard lands, the client state, at least, of the Carolingian Empire, the Duchy of Spoleto would have been, at least the dukedom in the person of Hildebrand, would have conferred him th the control on the entire duchy, um, plus the one of Benevent as well. So, you see, in the Middle Ages, there wasn't like something like international law today, where there is more or less a much more highly standardized and stratified and consolidated and recognized. It, things may be similar to, to some degree, but let's say the the difference between Britain culture, treaties, diplomatics, things like that, and 
practice, the practice of war and politics, etc. It was very different, right? Um, in in a in the privilege of Louis the Pious of eight hundred seventeen, you have uh, stated the effective possession of the Comitatus of Sabina. However, to the uh, to the church, right? Uh, it's worth noticing that given that the Roman Church had taken over the, the Roman Duchy by name, and so in theory, every even though they couldn't occupy it, but all the the public land belonged to the church. That was the case in Rome, and that's why they had also such a great power because there weren't really other, say, even local lords being able to counter the papal prestige in spite of the strong Roman nobility and so on um, and th you find an addition in the same privilege of Louis de Pius stating that only quote the donations that used to be annually brought to the palace of the Longobard kings both from the Longobard Tusha and from the Spoleto Daci so that every year the aforesaid census is paid to the church of St. Peter thus saving our domination over the same duchies in everything Right, so the sense um, that the uh, the Carolingians had made a favor to the um, the popes by stating that whatever pertained to the Longobartusha, remember before as Tuscany, and the Spoletan Duchy had usually been paid to Lombard Longobard King as part of the kingdom, now had to be given to Saint Peter. Right, um, and uh, this was done to essentially maintain again the stability of the area, even though of course uh, the 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 lay power would, would control the fact of uh, aside from this annual uh, you know donation right to 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 the Longobard king to um, to, to to the duke. Right, so w what does it mean? It means that these lands would not receive the annual donation. Say the the the, the Frankish kings wouldn't receive um, from these lands of Tusha and Spoleto the same donations that were done uh, were given to to the king traditionally. Now were not given to the papacy, but of course the um, lay rulers ruled still and got the other revenues from these lands. Uh, we see this closer appearing even in the successive privileges than that of Henry II, the last of the Etonians. Um, only Otto IV uh, of Brunswick, in the capitulation of Neuss in 1201, will make, however, a complete and definitive renunciation to duchy as such, because uh, he was simply contracting the descent to Italy. This was the thing uh, uh, with Innocent III. Innocent III says, okay, I will crown you emperor in Rome, but you have to promise that you will not unite Germany and Sicily. Also because in Sicily there is my adoptive son, Frederick II of Einstein, and it's not you. It's your enemy as a Welfen. Promise that you will not reunite Sicily and Germany. And Otto says, of course, I will not reunite Sicily and Germany. The first thing he comes when he comes to Italy, he's, he reunites Italy and Germany, uh, Sicily and Germany. So this thing, it, also Italy, because at that point as an emperor had to be so. So that, that is the, what starts all the mess. Again, we, will, we have talked abundantly about that phase, also Frederick II's minority. But in the process, uh, Otto had still given up, basically... The, the dominion over Spoleto as a duchy. So already in 1198, Innocent III uh, implemented a program of territorial claiming of the state of the church, so even before the, the agreement of, uh, of Noise, affirming his dominion over Spoleto as much as over all the other cities of Umbria. So not even technically what was encompassed by entire Dutch. Because of course Umbria was an historical region and there were other cities, other things. And the Dutch, as we've seen, had, at least in its... Um, formally it existed, but say uh, in, in, uh, you know, in practice it was mostly just a formality, 
right? So Innocent III, peak of Roman Catholicism, pap papal power, that's what he does. I made multiple videos about Innocent III if you're interested and we'll make lots more about him. Um, as a consequence of this papal affirmation, the old Count Conrad must abandon Spoleto to a new rector, which is the cardinal, Gregory Crescenzi. However, as we explained, uh, the papal dominion, uh, still at this point, was pretty, uh, you know, pretty unstable, right? And especially, again, the control of the church over Spoleto was, was that wavering. Right. Um, Otto IV resumed the duchy in 1210, for example, placing it under a certain Dutpold and eventually a certain Reina. Uh, so again, what he was doing, just coming to Italy, uh, bringing his own uh, Saxons or whomever, and placing them on uh, on the du as, as dukes locally. Right. Aside from Again, at this point, powers play on such a bigger scale that uh, you don't have to literally control every single place locally to be, say, hegemonic if your boss is the the Holy Roman Emperor. doesn't matter how much it's communicated at this point, but it, it's a big deal, right? It, it's, much, it's part of a much bigger game. I mean, the entire Kingdom of Sicily, like, the Dutch of Spoleto at this point is mostly, again, still important. It, it retains its strategic value or whatever but there are lots of other cities there um, that um, do not do not even respond right there are some Guelphs there are some Ghibellines so it all it all depends um, interestingly enough um, 16 years later Frederick II that is king of Italy and as, and as such um, not just of Sicily and of Germany as Holy Roman Emperor um, but uh, he installed his, uh, say, uh, say Reinald, that was the, the son of the old Count Conrad, uh, as Duke of Spoleto. However, given that Frederick's reign, and we made different videos about Frederick, his, uh, of course, uh, life was quite messed up as far as the relation with, with the papacy, constant war and so on, and he could not do whatever he wanted, and he had to negotiate and compromise. He disavowed the same Reinald um, after the remonstrances and the resolute demeanor of Pope Gregory the Ninth, where in 1231. So again, the, the Pope said, "No, that's my, that's mine from the time of Innocent the Third. It's the churches. It's the patrimony of Saint Peter. You can't touch that." Uh, so he, Frederick says, "Okay, well, you know, this guy there is. It's not that there aren't Frederick's supporters there, uh, as much as papal ones, but it, it's important formally to say how much as an emperor do you support, you know, uh, the existence still of a sort of lay independent duchy that is not actually the churches, so that you can touch. That can uh, raise the political thermometer. Now, from then on." And particularly after the end of the Swabians, as you can imagine, because, you know, after that, the Angevins came, those were papal creatures. Doesn't matter how aggressive they actually were, indeed. Um, there is all a history of the Ducatus Spolitanus, right? But um, there wouldn't be the, rea the attempt to reactivate this duchy, right? Which is definitely... Um, it it's actually surviving, in a sense, because still the church... Um, incorporates the um, at least the, the the hierarchical system again. They, they insult themselves at the place of the dukes, right? So through the government of papal rectors, you have there some some administrative structures still work, right? Uh, the base of previous system, um, which is definitely reduced in size, right? If you you can't really reduce political. Dominations, not just the medieval ones, to just territorial, especially linear territorial extent, right? Um, but definitely, this duchy, in the meanwhile, as an object of content, has also been reduced in size and power. I mean, the same popes were just trying to counter, 
Otto IV, Frederick II were just damaging what with all the wars and uh, and all the resources that the same emperors drew from there like this thing was becoming just a a playing ground right so uh, definitely you know not what it had been once upon a time but still important right as a territorial subdivision of the papal states uh, of the church that will um will remain in fact also in a more uh, as you know clumsily mm, say packed you know but still you know non, uh, historically consistent fashion right part of the papal state that's why the term comes from political so because of the graduality of how it was formed uh, from the, the difference from nature from which this this powers had emerged and etc so uh, i hope this video explains essentially what the history of the duchy is as you know i i care about covering all the various polities in europe it's not easy to do this ones are really important because i feel that italy is treated as like most people do not even properly study uh, the history because they don't understand the concept of you know being a power without being a national monarchy this is a problem that uh, we have substantially with you know w with history and how we, especially the medieval one right it's not just because of how we tell this but let's say there is some kind of properly of distortion um, in terms of how you, you you represent different parts of Europe through a set of biases that actually stem from different directions. But it's important to acclimatate oneself if you want to know the Middle Ages well with this kind of uh, of analysis, because there is no such thing like understanding the Middle Ages if you do not pass through these things. Right, it's. Uh, I'm very disappointed with what I see usually around in on YouTube, uh, as far as you know, the incredibly cheap, superficial, simple, and actually wrong, right? Just by manual um, interpretations of, of the history for, for what? Right? Do you think you can learn the Middle Ages um, with a cheap, cute little cartoon video with that? doesn't even make you two, do, do pl two plus two in terms of the, the, the work, the homework is necessary to understand this mechanism. It doesn't work like that. I mean, it's it's useless. Right? It can't be maybe inter entertaining, more entertaining than my videos, uh, if you are searching for the cute uh, pictures and stolen very often, by the way, by actual copyrighted material that I went a great length to avoid to use at any time. As you understand here, with all the you know Wikimedia Commons um, credits that I use, basically I use only that because it's the only free one. Um, so you understand the point, right? That this uh, going step by step with these policies is crucial, and it can't be avoided, right? If you care about history, if you don't, okay. But at that point, why should you care about my channel at all? Um, in any case. Uh, for today i stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time